This episode of the podcast is dedicated to the late George Jacobi, who was a pillar in beta-lactamase research community and a leader in the field of antimicrobial resistance. Assigning names to beta-lactamase variants has been inconsistent and has led to confusion in the published literature. The common availability of whole genome sequencing nowadays has resulted in an exponential growth in the number of new beta-lactamase genes. In November 2021, an international group of beta-lactamase experts met virtually to develop a consensus for the way naturally occurring beta-lactamase genes should be named. And we are going to uh, discuss this consensus in this episode. So the objectives of this episode is to discuss the inconsistency in beta-lactamase nomenclature, propose guidelines for publication of new alleles and newly discovered beta-lactamase, and deliberate on future needs of consensus among the beta-lactamase community. Welcome to Editors in Conversations. This episode is brought to you by Antimicrobial Agents and Chemotherapy Journal, available at aac.asm.org. I'm your host, Cesar Arias, Editor-in-Chief of Antimicrobial Agents and Chemotherapy. This podcast is supported by the American Society for Microbiology, which publishes AAC. Don't forget to check our latest papers and issues on AAC available at our, our website with outstanding papers on mechanisms of resistance, pharmacology of antimicrobial agents, epidemiology, and clinical therapeutics, in, amongst others. Join, joining us to discuss this important topic, I am very, very uh, honored to have uh, these uh, leaders in the field. Um, who actually led this effort for the beta-lactamase consensus nomenclature. I'm very grateful for that. Is Dr. Patricia Bradford, who is uh, from Antimicrobial Development Specialist, LLC. Dr. Karen Bush, who is Professor of Practice Biotechnology and Interim Director of Biotechnology Pro Program at Indiana University. And Robert Bonomo, who is Professor at Case Western Race University and Director of the VA CARES Research Collaborative in Cleveland. Welcome to the program. Thank you so, so let's uh, start this. As I mentioned before, this uh, podcast is dedicated to the memory of George Jacoby and uh, no one else more qualified to talk about the uh, achievements and, and contribution of George Jacoby than Dr. Karen Bush. Yes, Dr. Jacoby has been a leader, was a leader in the field of beta-lactamases since he started working in those enzymes in 1963. He's published, he had published many papers uh, dealing with the characterization of new beta-lactamases, particularly those that were plasmid encoded beta-lactamases. Uh, he was involved with uh, some of the early nomenclature. When we first started working with the plasmid encoded enzymes, there were attempts to put together functional classifications. When we got to the point where we could start sequencing beta-lactamases, we then had molecular classes. And we started with classes A and B uh, that Ambler had suggested in 1980. We then had a class C for the chromosomal beta-lactamases. And Dr. Jacoby was responsible for realizing that our OXA enzymes belong to a fourth molecular class, that of the class D enzymes. When we began to see extended spectrum beta-lactamases in the 1980s, we realized that uh, we were seeing mutations in enzymes that had been around for many years that did not appear to be mutating. When we started using expanded spectrum cephalosporins, then we saw a number of derivatives of the TEM beta-lactamase and the SHV beta-lactamases. We got to the point in the early 1990s where we were seeing multiple names for the same enzymes. We were seeing multiple uh, journals using the same name for different enzymes. And in 1996, there was a meeting at ICAC whereby the uh, beta-lactamase community decided that Dr. Jacoby, who was the editor-in-chief of AAC at that time, should be responsible for curating the names of new beta-lactamases. And at that point, 
he established a site at the Leahy Clinic, a website that was initially responsible for assigning names to the ESBLs and to the inhibitor-resistant TAM beta-lactamases that we were seeing. He continued that activity until about 2015, when we saw many, many new beta-lactamases that had no functions assigned to them. They were simply uh, sequences of amino acids, sequences of nucleotides that translated into amino acids. Uh, Dr. Jacoby and Dr. Medeiros and I had attempted to do a functional classification of these enzymes that uh, were no longer really being uh, classified according to function, but only according to sequence. So in 2015, the task of assigning numbers of beta-lactamases was assigned to the NCBI. And I will pass this along then to uh, Dr. Bradford. Um, yes, Cesar, did you? Did you yeah, no, I was just, I was just uh, um, thinking, uh, Karen, for um, um, having that perspective on, um, on George. Um, um, he was editor-in-chief of AAC, I'm very grateful. Um, as as a, a recipient of all his knowledge, and I learned all of this from him. So uh, I want to highlight that and, and keep um, my memories and all of us uh, uh, honoring his memory. Um, you know, he, he was a, a, a really an engine and um, pillar on all this, as you mentioned. Um, but there was a point that, you know, even even with his grandeur and his thinking, there was overwhelming information that he couldn't handle himself. So, Patty, so so you noticed this a long time ago, and there was a lot of situations in which we, we were based, um, particularly with our journals, uh, conflicted with people who will be writing relactamazine um, or reporting relactamazine in different um, in different ways. So, can you? Uh, um, you know, sort of give us an, 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 an a summary of, of, of what led you to lead this effort. Yes, thank you, Cesar. Um, so as Karen mentioned, there has just been an explosion of beta-lactamases over the last number of years. Um, many, many new uh, beta-lactamases that have been um, sequenced and with the, the you know, the, uh, the coming of whole genome sequencing, um, there have been many, many more um, beta-lactamases. Um, also, a lot of these efforts were um, to, to, uh, to name beta-lactamases and to set rules for them were um, made kind of like a grassroots effort by uh, beta-lactamase researchers who would meet at ICAC every year or um, some other meetings. And, you know, although we would come to a consensus at the meeting and those of us who were present understood the rules, um, you know, that those kinds of meetings haven't happened for a little while. And um, now we have lots and lots of new researchers who may not have even known that these rules exist. Um, in the last couple of years, um, several of us who are editors now for some ASM journals and some journals, uh, not in ASM journals, but have noticed that um, there have been papers submitted with names that either didn't fit the standard naming scheme, or there were conflicting names, or maybe two people were claiming the same name, but had the different sequence. And so um, when uh, th this came to this came to a really a, a point last year, um, middle of last year, when um, one of the authors of these papers, when they were challenged of it said, Okay, where are the rules? And we came to realize that actually, the rules aren't very clear as they had been written in the instructions to authors for antimicrobial agents and chemotherapy. And so that we really needed to um, do a better job of formalizing, um, you know, this is the way we've already done, always done it, but we really need to, um, to, to we needed to formalize and put down in writing what the rules are for nomenclature of beta-lactamases. And that's, that's, uh... That was a great effort, um, Patty. And one of the things that uh, you organized was a consensus and um, all you, Karen and, and Robert. So tell us a little bit about that meeting that took place in November, 2021. 
and and how we um, try to um, bring all the experts in the world of this of this topic. Thank you. So we, um, Karen and Robert and I and Cesar, um, the four of us started it out. Um, we included um, three scientists, three three data scientists from uh, the National Center for Biotechnology Information, NCBI, um, and several other um, bilactomase ex experts um, to have a steering committee um, to uh, put down a draft of what we thought the rules should be. And there were there were 12 of us on that steering committee and the late George Jacoby was one of those and we're, we were so grateful for his input. So we um, we started it out by putting uh, putting down a list of what these rules should be. And then we um, thought that we should really um, bring it to the larger beta research community. And so we came up with a list of 75 researchers um, who were invited to attend a virtual workshop in November and 52 of those invitees um, attended this workshop that was a, a morning long in November, which I thought that was really fantastic that we could, um, we could get uh, so many people on a Zoom meeting <laughs> in, uh, in, in one day. And those, uh, those, those 52 attendees were from 19 different countries. And so we really had a lot of different viewpoints and a lot of different experiences um, uh, represented well, in that meeting. And so we were able to go through the draft rules. Uh, we had a number of presentations about the rules and um, also about um, what it would take to actually publish a new beta-lactamase. And then, um, you know, again, technology is a great thing. We were able to have some breakout rooms. And um, so we had four different breakout rooms. And so these smaller groups, people were really able to voice their either approval or disapproval <laughs> as some of the ideas for what the rules should be. So really everyone had a chance to speak up and say their piece about what they what they thought they would what the rules should be. So Robert, uh, you know uh, you know more than everybody, and thank you, Patty, for that overview. Um, uh, it, it's hard to please everybody. Um, so um, so what what do you think the the main disagreements are in, among the community? And, and you could summarize in in that meeting that that was very palpable. Um, what 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 are contentious uh, issues in that meeting? Positive things first. The, one of the real positive aspects of the of this meeting, and thanks to you know Patty and Karen and your leadership, was that we were able to come to a very good consensus about what makes a beta lactamase unique. And you know, like you know, there was a good description of you know particular changes that were required and. Those sorts of things were agreed upon very readily. And um, I think what was a little bit more problematic, if you will, is the level, at least according to my ears and my uh, participation, is the level of characterization that was required to assign a particular, uh, 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 I was going to say phenotype, a particular phenotype to an enzyme. And you know, th this reflects a lot of, you know, where our science is in many ways. And, you know, right now it's very facile to get whole genome sequencing. It's very easy to find a, a new beta-lactamase gene. And there are a lot of very sophisticated computer programs that can help you identify that. But how that beta-lactamase manifests itself in a cell is not so easily interpreted by the sequence. You can make good guesses, but, you know, the actual phenotype of that beta-lactamase can only be readily demonstrated uh, when the enzyme is expressed in a uniform genetic background, when the enzyme is purified, and when kinetic characterization is, is, is done. And those are very not so easy steps, you know, because although you can express an enzyme well in E. coli, and there are, but there are certain... Uh, accommodations, you know, certain rules of the road that you need to, to, to keep in mind. And, you know, whether an enzyme is able to confer resistance to a substrate in an, a Petri dish or in a broth is not the same as that enzyme actually working on a cuvette or 
you know, in a uh, small confined glass receptacle, if you will, where you're trying to measure rates of turnover. And another problematic thing is just, you know, uh, is like wh- how pure does the enzyme have to be for you to say that it's a particular type of enzyme? Um, what are the substrates that you should use to characterize an enzyme? There's more consensus about that. Uh, but, you know, exactly, you know, whether something is a ESBL or, you know, sometimes that gets a little tricky. And I think people, you know, had a little bit of a contention about that. But I think we came to some very good uh, agreements and rules and consensus as to what uh, to how to best go about this. But, you know, like you have 75 people in a room, you may get 80 opinions. You know, that's just the way it is. Absolutely. So, absolutely. So, so Karen, uh, so you are a world leader in this functional characterization of the enzymes. Um, and as an editor in chief, we had a, a, a position in AAC that if you find an enzyme, um, I, we would like the authors to prove that it's a new enzyme. So, what, what are the what are the nuances and the depth of characterization that now we are proposing for for a paper in, in when you report a new enzyme in in our journal? Well, I think the first requirement is that it has a unique amino acid sequence. At that point, we would like to know: Does it have a spectrum of activity that resembles the original TEM one? Uh, penicillinase type activity, or does it have an extended spectrum beta lactamase activity whereby it will hydrolyze uh, substrates like cefotaxime and ceftazidine? Is it possibly a carbapenemase that would hydrolyze imipenem or miropenem? These are the kinds of questions that we would like to know. We also would like to know whether it can be inhibited by the classical beta-lactamase inhibitors, clavulanic acid and tazobactam. These kinds of characterizations are usually not done by molecular biologists who can very easily, as Robert mentioned, can very easily find a new sequence or find a beta-lactamase sequence, but we don't know what it does. And so having a purified enzyme or having an enzyme in a background that has no other beta-lactamase activity, but perhaps cannot be completely purified to 95% homogeneity, uh, these are criteria that we thought would be important. And uh, the, the, there was a... Uh, some comments about the role of MICs in the characterization of these enzymes. Uh, can can you comment a little bit about uh, why perhaps the MIC alone could be not the ideal test of EBDs, how that should be done? Yeah. yeah. Patricia is the clinical microbiologist here. Yeah. So, um, yes, this was one of the areas where we had a lot of uh, contention about about, um, whether MICs could be used to characterize new beta-lactamases. It's it was and there were strong feelings on both sides. So, you know, the the pros of using MICs to characterize new beta-lactamases is that um, in a whole cell, sometimes um, sometimes drugs and enzymes behave differently in the interaction in a whole cell. So you get different information. Um, I think the main contention though, was that um, doing biochemistry correctly to characterize beta-lactamases is difficult and not really, there are not very many labs that can do it right and do it well. And so um, we were in in the inclusion of having MICs um, be available as a way to characterize these enzyme. It was a way to be more inclusive of having labs that may be, um, you know, more resource limited, um, be able to provide some information. But having said that, we um, came up with some pretty strict guidelines that it can't be a clinical isolate. You have to, it has to be a clone that's expressed in a in a background that doesn't have a natural beta lactamase expression in it. 
Um, and there were some other guidelines that we put forth. So it has to be as clean as possible of a background before you do the MIC test. Uh, Robert, any comments on the MIC issue? Uh, no, I agree with uh, uh, Patty and Karen. Um, but I, I, I do not take the issue of MICs very lightly. I think, um, you know, it's a very, very important test that needs to be done in a very strict and controlled setting. Um, you know, I prefer that the appropriate controls always be done, you know, a, a strain without any beta lactamase in it. Uh, if it's a new beta lactamase, the, the derivative, you know, the origin of that beta lactamase, if you will, uh, you know, uh, uh, be included in the comparison. And uh, I also like to include the original clinical isolate from which I got, from which that, that per, the beta lactamase in question is, even if it is in the setting of multiple beta lactamase, it's important to know how, you know, what the clinical, you know, interplay is of that beta lactamase with, with other beta lactamases. So I take the issue of uh, 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 MIC characterization very seriously. And I think you need to also include some of the classical beta lactamase inhibitors, like Karen said, clavulanic acid, tazobactam. I'll even throw sulbactam in there. Um, and, uh, you know, I think the new beta lactamase inhibitors have a big role too you know, AV, Vabra back to him, you know, rally back to him, et cetera. And there will be more. And the questions always be, you know, how many you should include or not. And I think that's something that we will have to address uh, potentially. Yeah, it, um, it'll keep us in business a while, Dr. Arias. <laughs> so, uh, do, uh, Dr. Bradford, so let's let's say there's somebody who has all whole genome sequencing and finds a novel allele, okay? And they want to publish that allele in AAC. So what, what would be the procedure to do that now with these new guidelines that will be published very soon? Yeah. So um, the first thing is uh, you mentioned a new allele. So the number one rule, and there was no argument about this, is that it has to be um, from a natural source. So the mutation, the mutated beta-lactamase has to be from a natural source. It cannot be a laboratory-derived um, mutant. So, um, and it can have the mutation in the leader sequence for the peptide, for, for the, the protein, um, but it has to be from a natural source. Um, we, uh, so the first thing that they need to do is to contact NCBI. And there is, there are several um, links in the commentary to how to do that. Um, so that, that's the first thing is to contact NCBI. They would submit their sequence um, through GenBank or one of the other um, databases and then submit that sequence to NCBI and NCBI will then in turn um, say yes or no, it's a new allele and they will give them a number. Um, and there are, the, so the main, um, the main groups of beta lactamases that we're talking about are TEM, SHV, and CTXM type ESBLs. There are several other families of beta lactamases that NCBI tracks also, um, but those may be revised in the future, such as the AMPC or OXA type beta lactamases, um, the rules for those are, are not quite as, uh, as strict at this point. Um, we're requesting, so if it's a brand new beta lactamase has, that's not one of those families, um, it is you know the prerogative of the authors to name that beta lactamase if it's completely brand new. We are asking though that people refrain from uh, basing that name on geographical uh, locations. Um, as there have been some issues for that. Um, we are also um, continuing to have the written format of the beta lactamase be the uh, lowercase blah in italics and then a subscript of the allele name. So uh, after they submit their, um, their allele to NCBI and get the number back, um, they can then submit that in a paper to AAC. Um, however, uh, it does have to have some kind of functional uh, assessment of that beta lactamase in in to, in order to be published in in AAC. So they can get the name without assessing the function, but they cannot publish it until they do something. And there are guidelines in there about what we've been talking about with biochemical and the MIC testing to assign some function. 
You will not be permitted to um, guess what the function might be. There are certain um, amino acid changes that have been noted that might lead to an ESBL phenotype or inhibitor resistant phenotype. But unless you actually do the work to, so, to show that it has that functionality, um, you can't assign that it has an ESBL. So no guessing allowed, right? No guessing Very allowed. Very important. So, um, and I want to also highlight the important role that NCBI is is playing here. They were also present in uh, in the in, our, in the meeting, and is is they are taking a, a mammoth mammoth role to trying to curate these beta lactamases. So, does anyone want to comment about that? I I would like to congratulate them on the seriousness that they have put into this task. When uh, George and I transferred the Leahy Clinic information to NCBI in 2015, they worked very closely with the two of us to be sure that all of the information from the Leahy site would be captured, would be archived, would be available in some way on the NCBI site. NCBI site. They were... Uh, very conscientious about trying to follow the rules that we had tried to establish that had kind of gotten out of control. But I think they deserve a lot of credit in all of this. Absolutely. Absolutely. And just one other, just one other thing that I wanted to um, to bring up. One thing that we haven't been very good about enforcing uh, the interactions with NCBI. And so from now on, we will be asking authors to provide written proof that they have had that interaction in the form of an email or some other documentation that they can submit along with their manuscript, but just so that we as editors know that they have actually um, spoken, you know, virtually with uh, with NCBI and, and have, have, that, have been given that allele number by them. Um, I, I realize this is a free-flowing conversation, and I know we've been all very serious, but was Dr. Arias um, trying to make a pun by like no guessing allowed? The guess enzymes are some of the most difficult to predict <laughs> what their phenotype is. So you really of course have to you caught my. <laughs> uh, so I was thinking, you know, Cesar, that was pretty clever. No guessing allowed. <laughs> you know, most of us can't figure out what a guess enzyme does unless you actually know it's been purified and and uh, tested in the lab. But I just thought that was very clever. That, that's one of the examples with the, all this confusion so sometimes generates. Um, so f from from um, from an outsider in the field like I am, really, um, uh, I, I was always very surprised about the ability to name a new enzyme uh, with a single amino acid change, or even nucleotide eventually did that. And... Um, and so when, when you work in other fields and you see how difficult that is to name all of this. So Karen, wh why is that important? I think that's important that the community understands the importance of amino acid changes in beta-lactamase enzymes. I think you need to go back to the ESBL story. Uh, when we first started seeing ESBLs, people were quite surprised to find that uh, these enzymes that all of a sudden could hydrolyze beta-lactams that we thought were rock stable. And uh, they differed only from the common TEM1 or the common SHV1 enzyme by one or two amino acids made us realize that there was a very definitive shift in function. And it was caused by only one or two amino acid changes. That was the point where we decided that they all needed separate names. Uh, absolutely. Robert? Uh, to follow up on that, that was one of the seminal observations that Dr. Jacoby made in a, a very important, I think the article was in the New England Journal of Medicine, where he actually described that for the first time there was a, a new antimicrobial resistance phenotype due to a single amino acid change. I, I think that, no? He didn't do that? No. Oh, I thought he did. He, he did that, but it was it was the French who actually did the initial oh. sequences. Oh, no, I know. No, no, no. I, I know they did the initial sequences, but he made that comment, in, uh, I think, in a piece in the New England Journal, if I'm not mistaken. 
So, um, of course, the, this, this beta-lactamase um, field is so complex, um, and there are still many gaps that we need to fill. Um, so, uh, Patty, so what are, you know, other areas that we probably need additional consensus um, to discuss later that will not be addressed with this, uh, mm -hmm. this initial agreement? Right. We already, um, I briefly touched on them. So there were in, in the conversations, both in the November, um, uh, November meeting that we had in the large group and then with the steering committee afterward, um, there were two, there are two families of beta lactamases that um, are still, um, will, will still need some work. And the first of those is the AMPC beta lactamases. So there are many genera of bacteria that have a chromosomal AMPC in them. And um, each of those genera, uh, that AMPC gene has multiple mutations. Some of them are meaningful, some of them are, are not meaningful. Certain researchers have um, started to number those um, alleles, those, those, those chromosomal AMPCs from um, Pseudomonas, from Acinetobacter, uh, whether or not any of those are meaningful. Um, but some of the other uh, genera like Enterobacter, Citrobacter are much less defined. Um, this is all clouded by the fact that some of these genes have now hopped onto plasmids and they're found um, in genera where they don't belong. So for example, uh, the CMY beta lactamase is very prevalent. CMY um, uh, came from Citrobacter, but is now found in many, many different other um, species of bacteria. So um, all that to say is we thought that we could not solve that problem <laughs> in this current effort to try to try to um, make these rules. And so, um, you know, hopefully that will be tackled in, in, in the future. Another class was um, the OXA type uh, enzymes. Um, these have a, actually a very long history of being confusing because originally they were known as PSE enzymes. They were known as CARB enzymes. Um, now they're all thrown in OXAs, but they're really quite diverse. They're all class D enzymes, but, but genetically they're, they're all quite diverse. And so, you know, again, it was too much in this current effort to try to rein that in and make up some rules for that. But in the future, that is something that should be addressed. So Robert, Karen, any comments on those enzyme types and nomenclature for the future? Well, I, th I think the class Ds are a major problem. There's something that uh, NCBI is quite concerned about. And I know that that's a major area that they want to tackle in the immediate future. I agree. Um, I think the, the, the other thing that's uh, um, also I, not as important as addressing the class D at this point, but when we go back and start making sense of the class B enzymes, you know, a lot of them are from environmental sources and the, you know, these are metalloenzymes. Um, they're going to be very uh, complicated. You know, there's already three different, you know, B1, B2, B3, and there's already you know, confusion as to what belongs in what B class and, you know, whether it's one metal ion or two metal ions that are in the active site. I, 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 I don't, I, I perfectly agree class D is more important, but I think when we start digging into class B, we'll see that that's going to be another, um, uh, for want of a, a better term, nightmare. So we, so we want to give uh, mainly this a, a framework to our reviewers to make these decisions uh, on, on, on this complexity. So uh, I want to go with if, if each of you, what advice will you give the reviewers of our journal? And, and they are very established, but now they will have a framework to work with to focus on and evaluating a paper that deals with pro probably a new beta lactamase. Um, you want to start, Patty? Yeah, that's a yeah, that's a loaded question, Cesar. Um, so, so the um, so there's two things, and you know, for AAC, um, it, there might be one answer. For some of the other journals, it might be another answer. So, when we say a new beta lactamase, um, the rules are that you can have a new name for any amino acid change, but that doesn't mean that it 
really is worthy of publication, right? So with regards to the reviewers, I think we should um, ask them to focus on what's new, what's a new feature about this allele? Um, does it behave any differently than, um, you know, with, with regards to substrate profile or hydrolysis rates, et cetera, uh, with regards to any of these um, any of these findings with, it, with the, their enzymes. Is it found in a, in a genus and species of bacteria where we've never seen it before? That type of thing. So really um, what, what's actually new about this report? Karen, any well, comments? I, I would tell reviewers that they need to be sure that any new names have been vetted by the NCBI group, because this is something that I've noticed in reviewing over the last couple of years, that uh, not everybody seems to be aware of the fact that they need to have somebody else suggest a name and that shouldn't be their prerogative to name an enzyme that's in another group that uh, uh, should be part of a family that already exists. I, and I think that this is something that reviewers don't really quite understand not all reviewers understand. I think with this uh, latest paper that will be coming out, uh, that we will have more, more uh, recognition of this by reviewers and editors. So I'm looking forward to seeing the publication of these guidelines. And just to follow up on what Karen said, um, so when you submit a sequence to GenBank, you can call it whatever you want to. So just having the GenBank submission number when you submit a paper is not sufficient for this purpose because the, the submitter can call it whatever they want to. So we really do want um, the reviewers and the editors to ask for that documentation of the interaction with NCBI to prove that they have claimed that name. Robert? Um, I, uh, I think it's, uh, the, the, you know, the one of the most thorny issues is going to be the you know, uh, biochemical characterization after the phenotypic characterization. And, you know, I think uh, reviewers and uh, scientists in the field need to be aware of, you know, how, what the correct way of, uh, what, a, what a good suggested way, I shouldn't say correct, because that's, that's putting value judgment on things, but what, a, what the suggested ways are to characterize some of these enzymes, they have to be aware of you know complexities in, in that characterization, um, you know we uh, reviewers need to be very careful, you know, with making sure that you know the the substrates that are used are of the appropriate quality that you can get the rates that you need to, so that you can describe something. And you know, I I, I think it you know. Uh, you know, a rose is a rose by any other name, and I get it. Um, but you know, there there are you know there are there are still going to be challenges in the field that we we we're going to have to face as reviewers and then as consumers of that science. And and I think, I think for the pharmaceutical companies particularly, it's a big deal. I think one of the other things that we have uh, noted in our guidelines are that we want comparators so that if you have a single enzyme that is a TEM derivative and you say it's different from this uh, extended spectrum beta-lactamase because it hydrolyzes cefotaxime 5% faster or something like that, you need to have the two enzymes tested side by side under identical conditions. And we need to know uh, for inhibitors, we need to know substrate concentrations. For metallobetalactamases, we need to know assay situ or assay conditions such as the zinc content, or for oxa enzymes, what's the bicarbonate concentration? These are all things that will affect the functionality of the enzymes, and it means that we can make valid comparisons as long as we have all of this biochemical information. And, and you know, it also you know, people sometimes use, you know, use trip to, you know, use one method to estimate protein concentration. And if you use another method, you get a different protein concentration. And that influences how you interpret your KCAT values. You know, uh, it, you know, it, there are lots of, but you know, that uh, uh, 
Dr. Bush and Dr. Bradford on this call are very, very sharp and they'll catch them all. Yeah, and I hope all our reviewers get uh, followed your example and this is one of the objectives of this podcast. So Patty, I'm gonna give you the last word uh, to, to close the podcast. Um, <laughs> Thank you. So um, this was a this was a great undertaking. I'm actually quite um, I'm a little surprised, and I'm very pleased that it came together quickly and well and so well that really from um, from identifying the problem sometime in the fall last year to um, you know the publication that's coming out um, it, it has all come together and um, you know if not for everyone's participation, not, not just the authors of the commentary, but everyone who participated in that meeting and gave their input, um, you know, this would not, not have come to fruition. And, um, you know, it also shows the dedication of all of those researchers and all those interested parties in solving the problem, but also adhering to the rules going forward and as reviewers and editors um, enforcing, you know, that, that, uh, that those rules are adhered to. So, I, I just really thank everyone who participated and um, I'm, I'm quite thrilled that it came together so quickly. And I'd like to thank Cesar for supporting this as the editor in chief. We appreciate Thank you very that. much, Karen. And I want to thank you guys for taking the leadership in the middle of a pandemic during a Omicron surge to try to pull this off. So it's really remarkable. And I thank you, uh, the journal, thank you, ASM, thank you for, for members like you who really take this very seriously and put it at a different level. So with this, uh, we're going to end the podcast. And uh, thank you very much for your participation. And this is uh, Cesar Arias, Editor-in-Chief of AAC, signing off.